So this presentation will deviate from pretty much from the specific topic of this meeting, which is oxygen production and reduction. But it aligns very well with the uh, overall theme of the series of this meeting, I mean, solar energy for sustainability, right? And um, I would like to add to um, Jim's list of examples of solar fuels and also what Jim mentioned uh, last part of his talk about um, drawing down more CO2 from, from the atmosphere to the soil. And this is part of uh, what we're going to talk about. I will discuss uh, projects, two projects, that the goal of both are to advance our understanding and our ability to improve on bioenergy crop production uh, in a sustainable manner. And a sustainable manner, what that means is to improve uh, bioenergy production on marginal lands, to drought tolerant plants or salinity stress tolerant plants, and so as to not compete with food crops. And also to do that, um, possibly simultaneously, to uh, funnel more carbon to the soil. So I will talk about two projects, um, and one of uh, those, we have two projects that deal with uh, sorghum as an emerging bioenergy crop, and I will discuss one of those. Uh, we call that Consortium for Advanced Sorghum Phenomics, or CASP. Uh, the goal of this project is to combine room-based phenotyping with molecular phenotyping and genomics to identify sorghum genotypes that are very suitable for uh, growing on marginal lands and also to use information to arrive at uh, models, um, genome to phenome models that allows us to, allow us to select genotypes for sorghum for dis different sites around the world, or primarily the US, uh, based on genomic information and or molecular information alone. This is a uh, multi-partner uh, um, um, collaboration. Uh, we are at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Are, we are leading this effort, and part of PNL, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, is also the Environmental Molecular Science Laboratory, or EMSO, which is a DOE-funded user facility, just like the Joint Genome Institute is a DOE-funded user facility. So we at PNL are doing molecular phenotyping, proteomics, metabolomics, lipidomics, and the Joint Genome Institute is doing the genomics part, geno uh, genotyping by sequencing and uh, genome-wide association study, GWAS. Our industrial partner, Blue River Technology out of California, are doing the drone-based phenotyping. And based on the drone-based phenotyping, we select genotypes for molecular phenotyping and for uh, genomic analysis. We have an industrial partner, Chromatin, which is a sorghum breeder, and we grow our sorghum in fields in California, at the place at the United, uh, um, um, University of California Research Extension Center in Kearney, the Kearney Agriculture Research Extension Center, uh, or CARE. And from this, uh, the information we get, uh, we will hand over to stakeholders to improve on sorghum further as a bioenergy crop. So this, um, the teams will be our PNL with the multiomics and uh, uh, molecular phenotyping, the Joint Genome Institute, John Vogel and his group, the Blue River, Mark Colgan and his team doing the room based phenotyping, the Crobatin team, and the CARE, which is the extension center where we grow our sorghum fields. This is also part of a larger effort. So uh, the projects that, was, that were awarded this um, grant from this particular DOE program called Terra, we collaborate within um, this uh, larger program. And it's a very concerted action on sorghum. We all work on sorghum. We have different um, robotics. We use drones. Others use more of a gantry system. We have different centers, sensors. We use hyperspectral cameras, uh, RGB cameras. And um, others have other kind of cameras, thermal imaging, for example. And um, we all are involved in different parts of genomic analysis. We use the same. Uh, uh, to a large extent the same genotypes of sorghum, so we get information from very different sites uh, across the U.S. A lot of um, the work is going into data analytics, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, and machine learning to arrive at models that allows us, allow us to look at uh, genomic and molecular phenotyping and select uh, genotypes based on, on this information alone. So why sorghum? Well, sorghum is um, it's not an emerging bioenergy crop anymore. It's a pretty much established bioenergy crop. It, it has 
produces large amount of biomass. It's already very drought tolerant and uh, very robust uh, crop. Can grow on marginal land. You want to understand why that is. We want to improve on this these traits even further. It's an annual crop. Many bioenergy crops are perennial, which is good in one sense because you, you have it planted and it grows for 10 to 15 years. But on the other hand, many farmers don't want to commit for that long a time because economy changes, administration changes, and their incentives for growing perennial crops will also change. So that's why an annual crop is a very good um, uh, alternative. Sorghum, just like corn, is a C4 crop, so it has a very um, advanced and very effective photosynthesis compared to seed free crops like wheat or rice. It's a small diploid genome and it's very tractable to genomic uh, editing and uh, CRISPR-Cas has been, we had that developed for, for sorghum. And um, as I mentioned, we collaborate with other pro uh, projects on working on sorghum. We have another project on sorghum where we look at epigenetics and how that confers drought tolerance and how it interacts with the rhizospheric microbial community. So we have a lot of projects that we can leverage uh, in this particular CASP project. So um, here you have see sorghum. This is Matt Colgan to the right there um, who drives the drones for us. And you can see tall sorghum plants. So sorghum origin, uh, the origin, um, the origin is uh, in West Africa, very hot regions and uh, warm regions. and, and um, it really doesn't flower until, it's photoperiod sensitive, so it doesn't flower until the days become 12 hours or so, short or shorter than 12 hours. So in many parts of the U.S. it doesn't flower, so you, that continuous vegetative growth, so you get very tall uh, plants. And um, many lines, the sorghum community have converted some of um, sorghum lines to being photoperiod insensitive, so they will flower also in the U.S. because you need seeds for that to continue production and also for fodder, grain, sorghum. This shows the biomass sorghum to the left. We have our sorghum feeds in California because that's, it never rains in California, <laughs> right? Except when it does, of course, which it did a couple of years ago. And, but even so, uh, so some, one of our fields were uh, spoiled, but uh, other than that, it, it really typically doesn't rain much, and like Rick told yesterday, he lives in the desert. And so the, the, it's important for us because we want to establish drought nurseries. So we can impose drought just by not watering. So we compare control and we compare drought, uh, plants exposed to drought. We selected from more than 1,000 different genotypes a diverse set of 648 different sorghum. You know, we want diversity because we want to be able to understand what genes are involved, what molecular pathways are involved. So we need to compare both those that are very drought tolerant, produce a large amount of biomass, with those who do not. So we can have this understand why we see this diversity at the molecular level and genomic level. We compared non-stress conditions and we compared with stress, drought stress before flowering and drought stress after flowering. We have two locations uh, in California. One, uh, the west side is, has where, in addition, to, we can, uh, in addition to drought, we can also impose salinity stress because the soil there is more saline than it is at the other station. So with this diversity, we cover a wide range of morphologically diverse sorghum uh, genotypes as shown to the left, and also the wide diversity when it comes to the, uh, the geographic region uh, of origin for these uh, plants. So we have these 648 different genotypes. And our the Blue River company fly over with their drones over the sorghum fields. And uh, in this case, they use LiDAR cameras. So what they can do is to, you see these field plots here. We have uh, each genotype has a, a specific plot in the, field, in the fields, in the two fields in California. And they um, measure height in this case. The redder, the taller is the plant, and they normalize that to the ground, which is blue. And from height and leaf area index, they can compute biomass. So we measure biomass, to wet biomass, and also biomass at 65% moisture content. And they fly over weekly, so we planted, we, the crew in California, planted in May, and we harvest late September, October. So they fly over 11 to 12 times weekly over the growing season and measure these uh, bio, uh, biomass traits. 
and it's a very high accuracy. We do ground truthing with the crew taking measurements also on ground, so we know we have very high um, uh, coefficient of, of uh, prediction close to one. So this shows how this data from the field plots is being con converted to plot data, and the output is on the table to the, to the right there. You can see the drone flying over the fields uh, to the upper left. And we also have a van, the river has a van, so we process the data already in the field, and we use uh, Wi-Fi, and if you are at regions where we don't have Wi-Fi, you can st st you, uh, store the data and, uh, offline, and then you convert, the, process the data when you get to the lab. But we, we have the Wi-Fi system set up, so we do all the processing already in the field. And I mentioned ground truthing, so uh, in a sort of a um, uh, random block format, measurements are being taken on sorghum uh, different places, uh, uh, the growth rate, the uh, height, stem count, seed uh, count, and biomass, so we know that we have very, re very reliable drone data, which is important because we um, moving forward, we, we will use this drone data for all our down selection and all our uh, that, um, model, uh, modeling efforts. So we have 648 genotypes. We have two locations in, Cal in California, three treatments. We have these four uh, functional traits that we measure, 11 time points. So we have over 170,000 phenotypic observations. This constitutes a very um, massive data set, a very valuable data set for us that lends itself to high density uh, genome-wide association studies and also molecular phenotyping. And that's what we do. We take this data, uh, drone data, we make a subset of um, genotypes that we use for genomic analysis and for uh, protein and metabolite analysis. And um, uh, with those data sets, we want to arrive at models where we can but like I said before, we want to use just genomic or molecular data to predict the phenotype. So what, what breeders do now and farmers do now, you take your sorghum, you plant it, you harvest and you measure biomass. And you make crosses and then you, you plant and you uh, uh, harvest the offspring and you evaluate how good that particular phenotype is. It takes years, millions of dollars. If you can instead look at the genome, and sequencing, genomic sequencing nowadays is very cheap, it's very fast. If you can look at the genome sequence and predict from that alone what the, how, what the performance will be in the field. If you know the, you know the field data, you know the soil, you know the microbial community in the soil, you know the weather pattern, you feed that into your model, and then you add genomic information. And or, and or, add molecular information. And then predict the outcome of um, and do this in silico. You can also do process in silico. So we have this 170 plus, 170,000 plus phenotypic observations. We, through the GWAS, we arrive at 213 peaks. We, the folks at the John Genome Institute, John Vogel and his group, 213 GWAS peaks that are strongly correlated with biomass or drought tolerance. We have started and we will continue for maybe <coughs> a year or so doing the uh, protein and metabolite analysis. Uh, we will have 8,000 protein signatures, 5,000 metabolite signatures. And we want to feed all that into correlative model, causative correlations, so that we can make these predictions I mentioned. Uh, we're lucky in the sense that we have, uh, the PNL is very strong in, in uh, national security, where they develop, a large portion of their work is to develop algorithms and models that we can detect um, uh, signals uh, among uh, background of massive noise. They, for example, snippets of phone conversations or emails where the keywords are, could indicate uh, terrorist threats. It's the same, same approach. You want, to say, you want to identify signals among noise. So the same algorithm can be used for biology. So that's what we, we leverage in, um, started to leverage in making sense of, of these data sets. So what we're particularly interested is in is to be able to go from genomic information genomic information to what we call external phenotypes, which, for example, biomass trait, or behavioral phenotype, which could be drought tolerance. And if we could do that, just looking at the genotype, that would be, like I mentioned before, we could save millions of dollars, we speed up, we believe, 
um, sorghum breed in particular from 10 years to three years. Another alternative is to go from internal phenotypes, for example, molecular data, protein data, metabolite data, and make predictions about the external phenotype. And we think this is also a way to go from genotype, genome to phenome, by using internal phenotype as a stopover. So that is um, uh, this CASP project. And I, I mentioned we have another project on sorghum where we look at how epigenetics is involved in conferring drought tolerance. And these two, um, um, we leverage these two products with each other. So we have two sorghum products that basically we treat as one, uh, trying to arrive at the same kind of information. How can we improve on sorghum as a drought, to very, very drought tolerant, high biomass yielding bioenergy crop and plant that on area where we, we, uh, we hand this information over to breeders and farmers and biotech companies to be able to have genotypes that we can uh, use on land where you couldn't grow any food crop, for example. And um, we're also interested in, also for this project, to be able to identify genotypes that have larger root system to find more carbon to the soil. We're not there yet with this project, but I will talk a little more about that in, in the next project. And here we don't use sorghum. We want to leverage model systems because we want to grow large amounts uh, very quickly, and we want to be able to genetically uh, engineer them uh, in a very straightforward manner. So we leverage the um, advantages that model grasses, model plants can offer. We use two different model grasses, Brachypodium, which is a C3 plants, and Sataria, which is a C4 plants. Sataria is an excellent model system for sorghum. It's the same, basically the same plant, it's just that it's a miniature form of sorghum. So what we want to do with these model systems is to, um, like I said, leverage their, their, uh, what they can offer. We also have large collections of um, recombinant inbred lines, mutants, natural accessions that we can use and look at diversity. One thing we want to do here is to build a virtual plant, make a, a plant model, a multi-scale plant model, and use that to uh, further understanding of how we can control photosynthetic allocation and utilization. And particularly we're interested in, can we allocate more photosynthate to the soil, to the root and then up to the soil, without jeopardizing harvestable portion of the plant? So that is part of what we want to use this model for. And this is also a multi-partner uh, project, but it's all within PNNL. So we have work, folks working on the multi-omics, uh, proteomics, metabolomics. We have folks working on the microbial side and the rhizospheric side, the modeling side. And we have statisticians and bioinformaticians and mathematicians over at the NASA Security Directorate. And um, uh, we work together as, 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 as a team. And one thing, uh, like I mentioned, we want to make a, a model. We want to make a 3D model where we combine uh, processes at the canopy level with processes at, at the rhizospheric uh, below ground level to get to an integrated, what we call plant microbe atmosphere soil system, an integrated virtual ecosystem if you want, but uh, rather we call it an interactome because UE criticized us for calling such a simple system an ecosystem, which in a way is an ecosystem, but it's, uh, we refer to the, we use the term interactome. And one specific question we ask is, how does the expression, genotypic information, how does that propagate within this interactum to inform processes, phenotypes across scale, from molecular scale to cellular scale to, to organismal scale, <coughs> all the way to this interactum scale? And that's the question we, we're trying to answer. So we make this figure to um, illustrate how we look on photosynthate uh, traveling from the plant down to the soil. So for the, most of the carbon enters the ecosystem through photosynthesis, some also through decomposition of litter. And the, carb the carbon, the photosynthate is allocated within the plant, some to the roots, and quite a bit actually. So around 20% of the recent photosynthate enters the soil through the roots. And out from the root as exudates into the soil where it's taken up by microbial communities, and some of it is respires back to the atmosphere. Some enters pools with different stability, laid by pools or more stable pools. The stable pools could have residence time of thousands of years, so then you talk about bona fide carbon sequestration. And carbon can 
re-enter the atmosphere also through emission of volatile organic compounds such as methane. And carbon also exits the oh, uh, system as uh, volatile organic compounds, VOCs. <coughs> and a lot of activity occurs in the rhizosphere, and this is an area where we are particularly interested because of the fact that we want to transfer more carbon to the soil. And we have enormous activity here in the rhizosphere, so the root exudates are substrate for microbial community, uh, bacteria and fungi. Uh, our vascular microfungal systems, for example, are very important in, 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 in taking care of the carbon. And this is critically important for the fitness of the plants, but also for the fate of carbon in the soil. We're also interested in the atmosphere, not so much in, in this particular project, but um, this is, as far as an interactum goes, this is for also very important, the processes that occur in the atmosphere. So the stomata are the pores by which CO2 is taken up and water and oxygen are being released to the atmosphere. It's also the pore for emission of volatile organic compounds, chiefly isoprene, but other terpenes as well, and methane, and alkenes, and alkanes, and fatty acids. And a plant can typically, on a daily basis, emit 1 to 7% of recent food synthate as volatile organic compounds, VUCs. But under stress, the VUC pattern changes enormously. And um, when, for example, photosynthesis is inhibited by heat stress, over 50% of carbon is lost as VUCs. Not necessarily as recent photosynthate, but from stored carbon. But nonetheless, it's carbon that is lost through the atmosphere. And it's a significant amount. And um, so it has impact for the carbon cycle as well as physiolo physiological impact and uh, biochemical impact for the plant. Very intriguing aspect of this is that a plant that has not yet been uh, subjected to stress can perceive VUCs emitted by stress plant community and, uh, and uh, execute response programs and anticipation of our oncoming stress. So when stress hits this plant, it's more prepared and can uh, um, deal with it better than plants that were unprepared. That is the biology part of, of this uh, equation. There is also a climate part of this because these VUCs are secondary organic pre precursors with secondary organic aerosols, which lead to climate effects. So it's a very, um, uh, these VUCs play a major role um, for an ecosystem. And then these um, uh, secondary organic aerosols and nanoparticles particles formed by them, as well as members of the atmospheric micro uh, microbiome, can be taken up by plants, presumably going in through the stomata. And what effect that has, we do not yet know. I like to show this. This is um, regarding the previous slide. We're sitting here, Janet and I, my wife and I, in the shade of this uh, sweet gum tree as it is in our backyard, and um, drinking our wine and minding our own business. And then we serendipitously we see this dance. And what this is is uh, VOCs emitted from this sweet gum tree mostly uh, isoprene, and it's consumed by the atmospheric micro microbial community, which in turn uh, are consumed by insects, uh, mayflies or some other insects. What we see here are the insects as a cloud, and uh, starting with the uh, isoprene emission or VOC emission from the sweet gum tree. And the sweet, I looked this up uh, just because I'm curious. This sweet gum tree of this size, which is 15 meters, in a temperature 80 degrees. This was 90 degrees that day, so we need, really needed that shade. And um, it can emit one gram of isoprene per hour. So it is, think of you having a, a forest or in, in, a, in, a, in a city, uh, uh, many of these trees. It's, it's very significant uh, emission of these uh, um, VUCs. Now, for this project, we are more interested, like I said, in, in, the, in the rhizosphere. We want to understand, can we increase allocation of photosynthate down to the soil without being penalized for um, biomass that we use for food or for bioenergy production? And we believe we can. And just to show the impact of what this can have, I was recently, a couple months ago, at the Sackler Forum meeting, which is a joint uh, National Academy of Sciences in the US and Royal Academy of Sciences in the UK in Chitley Hall outside London, we discussed ways to uh, deal with uh, carbon emission from uh, anthropogenic carbon emissions. And I showed this because this is one very interesting prediction. It's done by DOE. What it shows is, this shows the carbon stocks across the US. And the darker the color in, in, in metric tons per hectare, 
uh, the more is stored, and it's the first two meters of the soil. And then it's prediction made of Keith uh, Postonian from the Colorado University, how, what would happen if we increased root biomass, particularly if we increased root biomass in depth. So this shows three different scenarios. One is where we double the root biomass, and most of it goes, uh, make deeper uh, roots. Another scenario is that we increase root biomass by 50% and uh, a more modest uh, shift in depth. And the third scenario is 20% increase in root biomass and sort of little but still an increase in, in depth. And what it shows also is the, uh, the gray hair is, here is the status quo. The red shows how much of current um, uh, emission from um, uh, the US transportation fuel we could uh, offset by drawdown carbon to the soil in these diff three different scenarios. You can see it's a pretty significant amount. The best scenario, we can almost more than close to 70% of um, transportation emissions could be uh, of offset by this drawdown of CO2 into the soil by increasing uh, root biomass. And this map here shows the middle scenario. And you can see in many states we have much more darker, much more efficient um, carbon stocks in the soil. Now this, of course, is, um, uh, and we discuss, I discussed that with Keith Postonian, this is a model, of course, based on many assumptions, and, but in theory it holds very well. The practical implementations of this, of course, is not straightforward. No farmer in his or her right mind would um, grow plants just to get more carbon to the soil, if, especially <laughs> if it's, if it's you know, if it's just reallocation, so you get less biomass for food or for bioenergy, you have to have very strong financial incentives or, and or carbon taxation for that to uh, make sense. But it, so in this sense, it's important to um, realize that allocation of photosynthesis between above ground and below ground is not a, it's not a zero sum game because photosynthesis is inhibited by sink demand. So if you, it, photosynthesis goes on as long as you have sink to fill. When sinks are filled, it stops, because otherwise you get the photosystem, photophosphorylation would get overreduced and it doesn't make sense for the plants. So that means that, and you can show that particularly in C4 plants that are usually not CO2 inhibited. You can cut off leaves, photosynthesis in the remaining leaves increases. Or you, as been shown in, for example, in sugar cane very efficiently, you can um, introduce a non-metabolizable sink that doesn't produce sugars, which are the inhibiting factor in this sugar signaling mechanism, and they feel photosynthesis increases uh, accordingly to fill that sink. So if you can increase sink strength, for example, by making larger root systems, you, in theory, should be able to do that and maintaining also filling the sink above ground. So you just have to understand this sourcing communication, or you can also uh, uncouple um, sink demand from inhibition of photosynthesis. So there's a lot of opportunities to work on this. And um, we knew this is possible because we, um, years back, um, identified transcription factors as a master regulator in controlling uh, this allocation of above ground, below ground uh, biomass, or photosynthate to be above ground, below ground biomass as a, in the sugar signaling pathway. And we used that more recently for the different purpose we wanted to, um, we wanted to decrease methane emission from rice paddies. It was a Chinese collaboration. And uh, we did that by uh, decreasing uh, photosynthate to below ground biomass. And this shows here, this is the control. This is the root biomass from this transgenic rice plant, much less um, uh, root biomass. And this is the red here. And um, in the, uh, the corresponding small but still significant increase in above ground uh, biomass. In this case, increase in, in starch accumulation in the seeds. So we got much less, much less um, methane emission and more seeds. It's a win-win situation. We also done the opposite by increasing root biomass, and which is shown here, and it shows a um, slight decrease in above ground biomass, but not in tillers. So if we use this rice as a biomass plant, it would be a win-win situation again. So another way of dealing with this is to look at transporters for carbon and nitrogen. And um, so there are, uh, people have done that, and there are three reviews that discuss that. We wrote about this also some time ago. And Raton Lal has uh, uh, reported in many papers on the, the idea of transferring more carbon to the soil. 
And the third option is to look at genotypic diversity. And there is enormous diversity in plant functional traits, including root biomass, and we are looking at that at Punel, setting up a root phenotyping facility with X-ray computer tomography and electricity resistive tomography, which are both non-invasive uh, ways to look at root phenotyping. This shows an old uh, sorghum phenotyping, root phenotyping uh, project in the, from the 70s. Look at, if you see these here, there's enormous diversity in root biomass. So it's a, it's a resource to make use of when you can look for genotypes types that naturally transfer more carbon to the soil, and if you can combine that with the same amount of above ground biomass. And the third, or maybe it's fourth um, option, I'm not so done, um, is to harness the microbial community. So if you can enlist microbes in the rhizosphere to take up more carbon, pull more carbon, sort of the, the, the pull end of photosynthesis, the push end of photosynthesis, the source and uh, part of it will increase. And then you can also then store more of the carbon in the soil. And I should say that. Transferring more carbon to the soil is not only for long-term storage. That's in, in itself very important. That's what we want. But also, we want to have more carbon in the soil because soil is disappearing. Soil is really getting uh, to a stage where you have a hard time growing more plants. So we need to fertilize the car uh, soil with more carbon. So that has a dual purpose of uh, transferring carbon to the soil. Uh, I also show the people who are involved in these two projects. And uh, the funding is from DOE, different programs of DOE. It's also from PNL, and PNL is funded by DOE, so it's also DOE. And I would like to end with the beginning. This is the beginning of my career. It's not the beginning of Bertels, but it's pretty much early on. It's early, early on his, um, in his scientific uh, journey. Uh, this is outside Bertels' office uh, in the University of Lund, 1979. This is our first paper. You can't read it, but it's the trypsination of um, inside out thalacrid vesicles, right, in 1979. And um, we know now that this guy from, young man from <laughs> Finspong in Sweden has done pretty well for himself. So thank you. Thank you very much, Christo, for introducing us to this uh, brave new world of uh, photosynthesis. Yeah. Uh, you were thanking a lot of people, but not the uh, Royal Navy or the uh, American uh, Army or something? But well, I should mention that uh, uh, the modeling work we do, we also collaborate with, with DARPA, the Department of Defense. Okay. So, uh, Department of Energy and Department of Defense. I, I didn't mention Department of Defense, because that's a rather recent, but uh, I hope I mentioned UE. I, Okay, we have time. We don't have time, but we, we give him. I give yeah. you five more minutes to answer questions. I take them from uh, the next speaker. All right, okay. <laughs> yes. Um, maybe I missed it, um, but what is the solar to biomass conversion efficiency of your plants? Uh, so um, it's, well, the photosynthetic energy conversion is, it's, um, like three percent, like in many other plants. So it's not that can be improved, but that's a general um, that's a general feature of photosynthesis. So that can certainly be uh, closer to what is theoretical maximum. And uh, but it's a C4 plant, so it's much more. So if you look at it as a um, uh, perceived um, illumination, the, what just uh, just looking at the that the, uh, photosynthetic active radiation, then it's more like twelve percent. But if you look at the total um, incoming radiation, it's uh, in sorghum, which is C4 plant, 6%, 3% would be then for like in brachypodium. Huh? That's, uh, to my information, 3% is already quite high in the audience. Yeah. Yeah. Imran? Yeah. I mean, that's a theoretical, that's a theoretical uh, conversion efficiency. But that can be so, and uh, what we, the practical work is. In practice, it's like 10% of that. Much too high. Yeah. In Mexico, with uh, sugar, uh -huh. yeah. uh, it's 2%, 3%. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, Krista, uh, it's a very nice idea that uh, you, you, you want to uh, use the, the root system for uh, carbon storage. 
but uh, I mean, uh, when the plants are dying, I mean, these are annual plants, uh, the roots uh, will be degraded uh, sooner or later, so there, there will be an equilibrium, it will go not going forever. Well, yeah, so, but you can't, so that's the thing. In the purely statistically, the more carbon you get to the soil, there's a chance that some of it will be embedded in, in soil aggregates or will be converted to minerals like calcite or aragonite. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're looking at. That is a residence time of a thousand of years. Okay. I was going to ask the same about the micro microbial action there to release the CO2 and then in the soil. And then uh, how, how deep are you going to store the, because when you then start the planting again and you go and uh, make the soil good and fertile, so you release a lot of CO2 to, to the air in that mechanical right. process. So um, three or so meters we can easily get on the sorghum root system. So, and if then uh, some of that is being transferred to minerals or soil aggregates, that, so this, this um, model I showed is based on the, uh, on, on the theoretical conversion of some of the soil carbon to a, a recalcitrant form like uh, calcite or embedded in the soil aggregates. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> with that we thank Christo again. Thank you.